When this moment finally arrives, when the starship is ready to carry human beings to the red planet and carry them there to stay, not just for a short-term expedition, I think I can safely say that human history will never be the same. And given that as of this recording, we have yet to even land a starship without a spectacular explosion, this moment seems impossibly far off. But if Elon Musk gets his way, we're less than a decade away from this happening, from not only going to Mars, but beginning a human colony there, a lifeboat for the human species, and to make ourselves into a multi-planet civilization. A greater endeavor has never been attempted, not even close. But it's easy to say that we're going to establish a self-sustaining colony on Mars, a colony that's capable of surviving on its own, a million people. It's easy to say things like that, quite another to actually do it. And perhaps the greatest challenge is going to be finding the people, the right kind of people, who are willing to make such a supreme sacrifice to leave the beauty and magnificence of our planet behind and go to a desolate planet that is not friendly to human life. But what sorts of humans are going to be willing to make this sacrifice? Is courage going to be the most important asset? Or is it going to be scientific curiosity or education or just the sheer desire for adventure? Well, I think it's going to be a combination of all of these things and something a little extra besides. Something that I like to call the Martian way in the greatest respect and memory to Isaac Asimov. A unique way of thinking and living that's going to apply to the people who decide to go to this desolate world, desolate but beautiful at the same time, magnificently and uniquely alien. And these people are going to be fundamentally different from any other humans that they leave behind on Earth. So how are they going to be different? And how are they going to be attracted to go to this place? And most importantly, what sort of legacy are they going to leave for the human species if they are successful? Well, we're going to find all of that out in this special four-part series that I'm doing in conjunction with To The Future. So get ready for a very special event on The Angry Astronaut. Good afternoon and welcome to yet another episode of The Angry Astronaut. I know I always keep saying a special episode of The Angry Astronaut, but this one is especially exceptional. I don't know how else to put that. It was, well, probably lots of better ways to put that, but this is because I am doing another collaboration with the folks at To The Future. The people who, quite frankly, were responsible for getting my channel to where it is. At a time when I had less than a thousand subscribers, these folks who were much, much larger channel than I agreed to do a collaboration at Turn 
turned out to be a huge success and really just kickstarted my channel. I'm very grateful to them, to Sebastian and Shishuan, and I will always be grateful to them. So if you are not a subscriber of that channel, of To The Future, it's linked in the description. Go over there and subscribe right now before you even watch any more of this video. Okay, all of that having been said, this is a four-part series called The Martian Way. And what we agreed to talk about is how do you build a Martian colony? How do you build a self-sustaining large Martian colony of a million people that not only is self-sustaining, but perhaps ultimately becomes independent as well of the nations that help to form it? How is all of that going to take place? This particular episode that I'm going to be talking to you about today is focused on the beginnings of this colony. What sorts of people are going to be involved in creating it? What sorts of people are going to be recruited in creating it? How are you going to recruit these kinds of people? I mean, it's going to be a huge endeavor, to say the least. The people who go to Mars are not just going there to explore and then coming back. That's not what colonization is, obviously. This is going to stay. This is making a massive commitment that the longer you stay on Mars, the more impossible it's going to be to come back. Barring some huge breakthrough in technology or medical science, it's going to be increasingly impossible for anyone who goes to Mars to come back simply because of the gravity issues. Living in one-third gravity is going to take a toll on the human body, which although you might be fine for the long term, on Mars or asteroids or wherever else you want to explore throughout the solar system, returning to Earth may become an impossibility. And so therefore, um, quoting, I think, or paraphrasing a series that I'm very fond of, sort of a drama-mentary series, Mars has to be the most important thing in your life. If there's family, if there's career, if there's anything else on Earth that quite legitimately holds any more importance to you than Mars does, then you don't go. It's as simple as that because you're leaving all of that behind. You walk out the door and you never turn back if you decide that there's something on Earth that's more important than Mars. What an unbelievable commitment. What sorts of people are going to make that kind of commitment? And are the sorts of people that are willing to commit to that sort of thing, are they the kind of people that a colony is going to need? Well, we're going to explore all of that, explore how you attract people to Mars, what sorts of people are going to be needed, and what sort of people are likely to go. And we're going to do all of that, part one of this four-part series, right now. Now, there's a school of thought that says that the first group of colonists who go to Mars should be as small of a group as possible simply because of the incredible amount of danger involved and the bad press and the tragedy that would result if we lost this group of people. So perhaps half a dozen or a dozen colonists. But in my opinion, this is a flawed philosophy because we need to have redundancy in person personnel just as you need redundancy in equipment and if you don't have that you're setting yourself up for failure. Perhaps the most crucial area where you need redundancy is in the medical profession. You're going to need at least two doctors on the first expedition, and you probably won't have the luxury of having specialists. These will need to be general practitioners, ER docs, something along those lines, and it will also be important for them to be cross-trained in psychotherapy, some sort of psychiatric training on top of their medical training because the mental well-being of the colonists obviously is going to be just as important as their physical well-being. 
On top of this, it must be remembered that a lot of equipment is going to have arrived on cargo starships before the colonists even arrive in the first place, and this will include things like rovers, habitats, in situ resource production plants, all sorts of things that are going to require a lot of technical maintenance. Now, of course, we can rely on robots to some degree to take care of all of this stuff. Stuff, but for the most part, we're going to need highly technical, highly trained individuals who are also career astronauts since a lot of their work is going to be taking place on the Martian surface where it's pretty much just as dangerous as the vacuum of space in order to maintain all of this equipment. I would say a minimum of four of these types of people should also be included in the first group. So or up to six colonists already. And then you've got geology, the importance of which cannot be overstated. This is not just for scientific use, it's also for finding the necessary raw materials in the Martian surface for us to be able to survive. Obviously, there isn't going to be huge amounts of ice where our colony is located because things like the Korolev crater that you're looking at right now are located too close to the poles, too cold for a practical colony. So you're going to need other locations where ice is not quite so readily available and geologists who are capable of sniffing it out in large quantities and also the other sorts of materials that are going to be necessary. Things like volcanic basalt to make basaltic fiber, which is perhaps one of the best building materials that we could use on Mars. And of course, once you've found water ice, you're also going to need to find people who know how to use that water to make things grow, regardless of what other components might be in the water at the time. So you're going to need a couple of very good botanists, preferably botanists who have a lot of experience in using either hydroponics or my personal preference, aquaponics, which uses a rotating system of fish and plants in order to produce very high quality produce, plus you get fish on top of that. A system like this could definitely support at least a small colony to begin with, and you use it as a building block to more ambitious projects in the future, at least until we learn how to cleanse the Martian soil and fertilize it and start using it for our agricultural purposes as well. Now one type of colonist that I think gets overlooked are people with survival specialty skills. In other words, people who know how to survive in the desert or in other environments that don't have a lot of raw materials to offer. Obviously Mars is far more forbidding than any desert on Earth, but still people who have the knowledge and the capability to survive off of a minimal amount of raw materials and all also, the psychological fortitude to survive extreme isolation and extreme conditions would be very useful. So two more of these people as well. And just as important will be exobiologists, because I don't care what anybody has to say. The findings of the Viking landers on top of all of the discoveries that we've made since then strongly suggest the presence of bacterial and viral life on the surface of Mars. And it could potentially be dangerous to human life. And even if it isn't, discovering a new form of life on another planet would be invaluable scientific information to send back to Earth and a source of support for the new colony. And then, of course, once you've discovered in situ resources like volcanic basalt, as I mentioned before, to make basaltic fiber, then you need people who know how to use these resources in order to build new structures and new pieces of equipment that are necessary to the colony. Granted, some of these things they're going to know about beforehand and are going to have been constructed by robot before the colony begins, but 
But as the needs of the colony change, or if they discover new needs for the colony as time goes on, then these engineers are going to become increasingly important. And we're talking material engineers, construction engineers. At the very least, we're going to need two and quite possibly more for a beginning colony if it's going to be successful. And then, of course, with a new small colony, you're not exactly going to have democratic elections. You're going to need a mission commander and a mission first officer. And these are people that could have other specialties, but nevertheless, you're going to need these separate positions. Because if you lost a commander who is also one of your engineers, then you would lose two parts of your very important colonial structure, which would be unexpected. Acceptable. So you're going to need these two people at the very least in order to provide a command structure. And by the way, I love this picture of a astronaut stumbling across the remnants of our old Pathfinder missions. The rovers were so tiny back then. And then the final category, which is really going to be the unsung heroes of the colony, are going to be the support staff. Now, this is the sort of thing that NASA missions in the past have not had. But the reason for that is, is because they have the luxury of a huge staff of support personnel back in Houston. Martian colonists are not going to have the same thing. So you're going to need backup personnel to essentially help all of the colonists with whatever tasks they may have. These folks are going to have basic training. They're going to know how to do EVAs. They'll need to have some training and education and practically everything that the colony does in order to be able to provide support. And how many of these are we going to need? I would say four to six at minimum in order for the colony to run smoothly so you don't have highly specialized people doing basic tasks. So just to get a basic colony going on Mars is going to require, in my opinion, 22 to 24 colonists. And those numbers are going to increase radically as the colony increases in size. You're going to need new specialties like miners, for example, that sort of thing. And how are you going to attract people to come to this sort of environment? This desolate place that's going to have no return if you stay there for too long. Well, one of the first things, as you can see here, is to give these people a decent place to live. I like this particular design from Yates because of all of the natural lighting and the spaciousness. In an environment where you're going to be cooped up indoors, this sort of pleasant environment is going to be an absolute essential. Any environment where we've done experiments here on Earth with people isolated for hundreds of days at a time, even with people who have passed very thorough psychiatric analyses, have ended up with serious problems by the end of it. And look at this front porch kind of concept, giving the illusion of being able to go outside on a planet where you clearly can't without a spacesuit. A very beautiful place indeed. And here's another essential, location, location, location. And I have talked about establishing a colony in the Vallis Marineris until I am blue in the face. But I think that it's very important that we establish our first colony in a place like this, where colonists wake up in the morning to unbelievable sights. Canyon walls that are 8,000 meters high, something that you simply could couldn't see on Earth. And not only could you have the adventure of exploring a place like this, could you imagine zip lining down from cliffs that are nearly the height of Mount Everest? <laughs> if that could even be possible, I think that that would be a mind blowing experience that could really draw colonists to this planet. 
And for those colonists fortunate enough to take a quick journey down to the southern hemisphere, you would have Rabe Crater, and that large black area is not a false color photograph. That's actually basaltic sand, and it is black. Huge black sand dunes that are up to 200 meters high, and it has been proposed that somebody could surf down the side of those dunes on some sort of high polished board or perhaps dry ice. How do you do this in a spacesuit without tearing the suit and killing yourself? Well, with a new type of spacesuit, of course, that some of you may have seen in a recent video of mine about something called a biosuit that uses a technology called mechanical counter pressure to deal with the huge pressure differences that exist on Mars. If you have something like this, not only is it a lot easier to maneuver around, but if you receive a breach in your space, suit, the mechanical counter pressure technology allows you to quickly patch it rather than have to dash off to save your life. And I mean hell, even just the act of jumping on Mars is entirely different as you can see in this UAE children's video. Imagine the kind of basketball that you could play on Mars, among many other things. Now am I saying all of this because I'd like Mars colonists to be a bunch of space tourists? Hardly. The point is, is that going to Mars and becoming a colonist doesn't have to be an exercise in extreme discomfort or agony or isolation. It can be an amazing adventure, unlike anything the human species has ever embarked on before. And that's the kind of thing that's going to attract colonists in the future, and that's what's going to get them to stay. Or at least, that's what I choose to believe. So before I go any further, some of you may be wondering or have observed, hey, this guy has new models on his table, and yes, indeed I do, from Spaceship Mania. This is a new version of the Starship, which was shipped to me just yesterday, as a matter of fact. And this is the Crew Dragon. And now you don't have to have the Crew Dragon 3D printed for you, or you don't just get the plans or something along those lines. By the way, I'm gonna probably mess it up here, but it's detachable, so that's kinda neat. Those sorts of things. So it's, uh, it's a very neat model, I must say, and they can be made for you. So you get the completed model when you order it from Spaceship Mania. Make sure to use Angry 10 to get a 10% discount because these are incredibly cool and they're really not that expensive for what they are, at least not in my opinion. Okay, enough of that. So, Really, I want to emphasize one more time just how important it's going to be when we establish a colony or colonies on Mars that we choose the location very, very carefully. If we choose a location based on you know, convenience or based on practical reasons alone. There's a lot of ice there, or it's very flat, so it's gonna be easy to land spacecraft, that kind of thing. I think we're gonna be cutting our own throats when it comes to the psychiatric well-being of the colonists. They're going to Mars to go on the greatest adventure in the history of the human species, going to another world, an alien world, with amazing sights and places, which I described during the course of the uh, part of the episode anyway, that are just unlike anything we have here on Earth. Amazing sights. And we don't want the colony to be thousands of kilometers away from these sorts of locations. We don't want it in the middle, at least in my opinion, in the middle of, say, the Amazonas Planitia, where you're thousands of kilometers away from Olympus Mons and even further away from some of the most magnificent sites 
on Mars. That's why I've advocated so strongly for the Valles Marineris, but there are many other sites which I've described as well. And living on the surface is also going to be of premium importance, in my opinion. Living in a cave, you may as well live on a cave on Earth if you're talking about surviving. There are many deep caves here on this planet where our species might be able to survive some sort of cataclysm. I think living on the surface and waking up every day to a magnificent sight, perhaps in the Valles Marineris of cliffs that are as high as Mount Everest, literally that high or nearly so in many parts of the canyon, or just, you know, some of the other sites that I've described. I think all of that is going to be very key. Just have the opportunity to go outside at regular EVAs, those sorts of things, which means we're going to need better space suits, you know, suits that allow us to wander, you know, and explore the, the Martian environment, the landscape around us, all of the magnificent and truly alien things about Mars that we find to be so fascinating. Places that we haven't dared even send a rover yet because of the difficulty of landing there. But from what I've been seeing from the Starship lately, this seems to be a ship that if it can land, it can land with an immense amount of precision, incredible precision. So as long as you have a flat surface that's a few football fields across, from what I've seen so far, that's probably a pretty good option as far as landing pads are concerned. So maybe we don't have to be so cautious in where we establish our colony. Maybe instead we need to think about where as a human being we or as, as human beings we would want to live rather than where it's the most practical to live. And by the way, there are plenty of things that are practical about these locations as well. The Valles Marineris, as I've mentioned many times, is an equatorial feature. And on the equator, it's a lot warmer and so life support is going to be a lot easier. And there are also many indications of water ice being present there. And that's just one of many locations. So I, I'm harping on about this, but I think it's very important. If you're making this commitment, making the decision to go to another planet for the rest of your life, then I would think that you want to go to the best locations, or one of them anyway, one of the best locations on the planet that the planet has to offer. There are many options, but when we choose our colony, we really need to keep these locations in mind, or at least have the colony in close proximity if we want happy colonists. Because sure, People can survive in caves, in mines, on submarines, that sort of thing for long stretches of time, but they do it with the knowledge that eventually they're going to go home. For Mars, this is going to be home. How much different would it be for a submariner if their submarine was home and they knew they had nowhere else to go? That would take a much greater toll and it's something we have to keep in mind. In any event, enough talking about that. Uh, part two of this series is coming out next week from To The Future, so keep watching that channel. Keep your eye on it. It's coming up very soon. And uh, if you want to support my channel, well, there are ways of doing it, as you can see here from Spaceship Mania and other ways that are listed in the description. So until we have the capability of establishing a colony on Mars and we are making these very, very important selections as to who's going to go and how to get them there, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.